Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by Squarespace, the all in one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code Know How. Cranky hippo, you bojo. Quadcopters don't fly without motors. You gotta have power. Welcome to Know How. It's a Twitch show where we bend, build, break, and upgrade. I'm Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next 45, 50, 60 minutes or so, we'll we're going to be gonna... making fools of ourselves. Yeah, we're yeah. going to be talking about Bojo and stuff. <laughs> no, this, this is a big quadcopter episode. Uh, yeah. Originally, we were kind of going to spread this out, but we got a couple of emails from fans who were like, well, I mean, this is nice and all, but we really want to get to the build. Can you push it? Can, you push <laughs> Can it we bit? rush this? <laughs> yeah. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually give you two of the segments that are going to tell you about motors and propellers so that mm -hmm. if you wanted to do your own build, you could at least get the frame together and then uh, follow us along with the wiring of the electronics. You will have the knowledge. The knowledge. In mm -hmm. the knowledge. Yes, exactly. Hole. <laughs> Did it need to be said? No. Did not know. Yes. <laughs> But I said it anyways. Okay, but before we get mm -hmm. to the whole quadcopter power thing, right. uh, there's a little story I want to talk about. It, it, it's, yeah. I covered it on a couple of my other shows, but I'm just so excited that I, I, I just I want to talk about it. <laughs> this is exciting. I remember when we talked about it, ooh, it feels like a few months ago now. Uh, yeah. Like yeah. It, maybe a half a year ago? Yeah, back with Project Loon. Mm -hmm. So the idea was Google was going to float a bunch of weather balloons, essentially, right. over areas without internet access so that you could get high speed rural access bounced off of these right. mini satellites. This was a Google X project, right? It was yeah. a Google X project and uh, the R&D for Loon was supposed to develop a technology that would allow you to take a weather balloon with a couple of smarts and a, uh, a set of radios for, mm -hmm. for, for internet connectivity. It used a tank of helium to raise the balloon to about 20 miles up. So it's, right. it's well up in the stratosphere. And the funny thing about getting something up that high is if you just increase and decrease the pressure of the helium inside of that balloon, mm -hmm. you can make it ride the air currents back and forth because you, right. you've got streams. There's, there's opposite air currents and then you can have them float between and move to different exactly. areas. Exactly, yeah. Which I guess I didn't remember this from before, but they have a 100-day uh, like lifespan. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, they come back down. Yeah, yeah, a lot of these balloons, uh, you know, you could get maybe 30, 40 days off of them. But mm -hmm. but Google figured out that if you, if you carefully control the amount of helium that it's using and if you use those air currents for station keeping you could get a hundred days or more out of a single tank of helium yeah well that's pretty cool yeah. I, that's yeah. a lot of time but I also I have a feel like helium's kind of a, a it's a very it's limited very rare. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, and you're getting more and more rare you're just <laughs> releasing it out in the atmosphere and yeah. it's, it's hard to get yeah and so so there were yeah there were a lot of issues with it it was a cool idea but it was very much pie in the sky mm -hmm. they tried it in New Zealand the tech worked but when you actually did the math and you thought about putting hundreds or thousands right, of these... Right, on a global scale kind it of thing. It wasn't, no. Right, but what they're doing now is they're, are they, they're going to do it in conjunction with Google Fiber? Yes, so they are, they are now taking the lessons that they learned from Project Loon mm -hmm. and they are going to be rolling it into something that they could deploy inside cities. This uh, last week, Google filed letters with the FCC asking them if they could start trials on a high-speed wireless service inside of, I believe it was Menlo Park and uh, uh, where else was that? Mountain View, California. So here Makes in the sense. Bay Area. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, here's, here's the difference. We've, we've had wireless municipal w systems before, mm -hmm. but what this is going to do is gonna, it's going to combine three different types of wireless arrays into a single device. That's cool. Yeah, so you've got 5.8. 5.8 is just like what you might have in your, your dual band router. It's, right. it's 
it's better than 2.4 gigahertz in that it's not as congested. It's faster than 2.4 gigahertz. It's not as easy to interfere with as 2.4 gigahertz, mm -hmm. but it does not have as much penetrating power. Along with the 5.8 gigahertz, they're going to have a 24.2 gigahertz. Now, this is the ubiquity radios that are already in Project Loon. It's the same ones that they were using. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, so you could get about 13 kilometers of range and about 1.4 gigabits per second of data transfer. That's pretty good. Then the third array is what's called a millimeter wave radio. It's 71 to 76 gigahertz. <laughs> Incredibly fine uh, uh, wavelength. It it's, uh, doesn't penetrate much, but you can get ridiculous distances. You can get about <laughs> 25 kilometers and you can get up to 10 uh, uh, gigabits per second on a single link, and then you wow. can bond multiple links. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So what they could do is if they, if they make enough of these arrays, they could spread them out throughout a city mm -hmm. and then anchor them to wherever they have Google Fiber. So instead of having to run Google Fiber to every house, you run it to like every neighborhood, and then you right. have one of these setups that spreads it out. Like a little beacon. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's the, the huge cost prohibiting thing is the actual installing of fiber in certain areas. Right? Exactly, yeah. Because you got to remember, when you, when you want to install fiber into a city that's already been built, like San Jose or San Francisco, right. you got to dig up streets. <laughs> Digging up streets is slow, yeah. tedious, and requires a lot of permits and a lot of money. What if you could just take it to a single point in mm -hmm. that neighborhood and then it's all wireless above ground from there? You Basically, once you've got that fiber, you can deploy a wireless network overnight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that sounds like a way more efficient way of doing it. Way more efficient and also it also it has a lot of redundancies mm -hmm. because once you've got these, these tri-arrays set up on buildings and towers, you now have the ability to create a, a mesh network which means it, it's actually it's more disaster resistant. You know, fiber gets cut all the time, right. but if you've got enough of these deployed over a city, you just have it, well, this one no longer has its, its backhaul, so we're just going to link it up with the other arrays, and cool, we got our, our mesh back. Very cool. Yeah. 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 So I'm looking forward to this, and uh, just to think, this all started with balloons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, we'll, hmm. we'll figure. Hmm. Now, uh, when we come back, we're going to be talking a little bit about your feedback. We've got two mm -hmm. bits and pieces from the Google community, and then, of course... All, All this. this. We, we're going to tell you how to t how to choose your motors and how to choose your propellers. But before we do that, uh, you know what? We we need to talk about our uh, the first sponsor of Know How and it's Squarespace. That's got to be Squarespace. Now, yeah. when you're thinking of the one stop shop for everything that you need to put on the internet, you go to Squarespace. Now, what is Squarespace? Squarespace has been the place that I've been using to uh, put all of the institutions that don't normally have an IT staff on the internet. If you've got a portfolio, if you've got a, a set of photos, if you've got a great project idea, Squarespace is where you want to go. Now, Squarespace is always improving their platform with new features, new designs, and even better support. They've got a beautiful template, uh, 25 of them actually, that you can choose from when you're first creating your site, which means you don't have to know HTML, you don't have to know anything about CSS, you just choose what looks good and your content fits into it. They also include a logo creator tool, which is a basic tool for individuals and small businesses with limited resources to create a simple identity for themselves. And it's easy to use, incredibly easy. But if you want some help, Squarespace has live chat and email support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Plus, there's a completely redesigned customer help site for easier access to self-help articles and video workshops. Oh, if, if you're interested in e-commerce, never fear, because that's included with your package. Now available for all subscription plan levels, Squarespace is going to give you the ability to accept donations, which is great for nonprofits. It also is only just $8 a month, so it's not going to break the bank. This is not some service that you're going to be paying pretty much everything that you have, putting all of your budget into just displaying the idea. No, no, you get to save most of your resources for developing your idea. Squarespace, with its $8 a month price, and it includes a free domain, means that you, you pay once and you get service everywhere. Now, it's mobile ready, which is important if you've ever created a site because it means that you're not going to have a different experience on a laptop or a desktop or a phone or a tablet. It automatically adjusts for whatever device the user is using. And it gives you the tools that you need, the Squarespace metric app for iPhone and iPad to check your site stats like your page views, your unique visitors, and your social media or followers. Now, with the blog app, you can make text updates, tap and drag images to change layouts, and monitor comments on the go, which means you're always creating, you're always getting out there. How oh, even their code is beautiful. This is important to me. I don't want to use a service that just takes a, a good look, but then just has absolutely horrible code behind the scenes. If you look at the code that Squarespace generates for you, it's clean, it's neat, it's beautiful. In other words, 
It's elegant. Oh, Squarespace takes care of the hosting with that one fee, so you don't have to. Now, this is what we want you to do. We want you to start a free two-week trial with no credit card required and start building your website today. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code KNOWHOW to get 10% off and to show your support for KNOWHOW. We thank Squarespace for their support of KNOWHOW, a better web awaits. And it starts with your new Squarespace website. Power! Exactly. Now, and that's why we're going to talk about the motors now, right? Yeah, okay, so we talked about the frames last time. What right. are you going to choose? So if, if you go to the overhead shot, so we've got a couple of different frames here. We've got the 250. This is sort of a sub-250. This is the trainer that we've been telling people to get. Yes, very uh, fun. Then we've got this, which is a 450. So we're, we're going up inside. And then this is actually a, the, the DJI that right. Twit had. I, I've been working on uh, deburking it. It's, <laughs> it was in pieces in the basement. It, it's been burked? It, it got burked. Oh, okay. But you know, this is sort of like the, a 350 or so. Remember. Right, because this, uh, this frame, you were saying, mm -hmm. is not that much... Different. Yeah, th actually, this is, a, this is a good thing. If you look at these frames, these two are much closer to, to each other than to this because on both of these frames, you have a central frame and then you hang everything off of it, all right. the electronics and the motors. On this one, there's no central frame. It's a shell right. that you put everything inside of. And without the top, it doesn't have it doesn't, a lot of structural exactly. integrity. Like If I tried to fly this right now without the top, mm -hmm. uh, it would snap. It, it, yeah. You need the complete thing. Whereas this, you know, the, the, the strength comes from the frame. Right. But, but we're not talking about frames right now. Okay. We're talking okay. about Sorry. motors. <laughs> yes. And when we talk about motors, there's a couple of things that we, we want to know about them. First of all, we got to talk a little bit about what a brushless motor is because mm -hmm. These are not the motors that we use for Project Lunchbox. Right, these are smaller. <laughs> well, these are, well, I mean, it doesn't have to be smaller, but the technology is slightly different. Oh, okay. So when we were playing with brushed motors, which is what we used That's in Project the, okay. Lunchbox, mm -hmm. we had a central core that rotated around, um, around permanent magnets, mm -hmm. right? And that, that central core would use a coil that you could charge to change the polarity of the magnetic field being created by that, that field. And as we know, if, you, if you've got like uh, poles, they'll push away from each other. Mm -hmm. And if you have dissimilar poles, they'll attract each other. So you just keep flipping it back and forth. And that's what generates the right, power. Right. But with a brushed motor, it's, it's different. <clears throat> See, in a brushed motor, the permanent magnet is actually stationary, and the armature is driven by the current. In other words, what we get is we get this can. Here, take, take a look at this one. Okay. We get the can that moves rather than the central core. So the, the, the right. motor is actually driven by the, uh, the, uh, the outside of the motor. In fact, uh, Alex, if you go ahead oh, and start yeah. that B-roll, uh, this shows you what the inside of a brush motor looks like. This is the 1740. Inside, you've got that stationary set of field magnets, coiled magnets. That so when so I run cool. current through that, I'm going to generate a field. But look at this Look at this ring. These are all permanent magnets that are going to be both propelled and attracted to the different coils as they engage their magnetic fields. Wow. Okay. And if you do that thousands of times a second, you can get a lot of rotation out of your motor, uh, which is, is absolutely fantastic. I mean, it, the nice thing about a brushed motor is that it's going to live longer because there's there's no brushes like you have in a brush motor that are going to wear down. It also means there's going to be less maintenance. They're actually a little easier to maintain than their brush motor counterparts. They're more efficient because there's less friction because there's nothing touching the, uh, the, the commutator. Mm -hmm. And it also decreases the amount of electromagnetic magnetic interference generated by the motor. Which would make it less efficient? Uh, which would make it, yeah, anytime you're generating heat or, or EMI, you're actually decreasing efficiency because that's energy that's being pushed somewhere else rather than into the motion of the mm -hmm. motor. Well, then what are the disadvantages? Uh, disadvantages of a, of a brush motor, it tends to be more expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, it tends to be more complicated because, well, I mean, you saw what the inside of this thing right. looks like. And it's slightly more prone to damage. Uh, uh, brushed motors mm -hmm. are really robust. You can slam them, you can you know, crush them, they'll still <laughs> keep going. Brushless motors, you kind of got to take care of. They're yeah, because I'm fairly certain the motorcycle uh, that I reviewed, the uh, e-bike, was brushless. It's oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's gonna want you're gonna want brushless because it's more efficient, but you can't bang on it like you would with a brushed motor. Okay. Yeah, I mean, but it's it's the technology is really the approach, approaching parity where yeah. it's not as if one is super delicate and one's not. Right. Uh, but you should keep that in mind. Okay. Now there are two types of brushless motors that we're gonna use for our quads. You're holding one of them. Mm -hmm. This is what's called a uh, an outrunner. 
Now, an outrunner is low, P low RPM, so low revolutions per minute, but higher torque. Right. Okay. And it's also direct drive. In other words, I'm going to go ahead and take uh, one of these propellers, and I'm going to attach it directly to my motor, to my shaft, which which uh, uh, it has a bunch of advantages. It's a much simpler system. It's it's actually a quieter system. But there are also others. All of our trainers are actually using what's called what are called in-running brushless motors. Hmm. Uh, go ahead and go to the overhead shot. You'll notice that uh, each motor here actually runs through a, um, a, gear. A, a gear, right. So you use a really high R, uh, RPM but very low torque uh, uh. motor that drives a reduction gear that's connected to the propeller. Now this is actually more efficient than outrunners and you get a, a wider selection of props because since I'm using that gear, that reduction gear, right. I can keep any prop in its golden zone a whole lot better than a direct drive. Uh, that's okay. just that's one of the things about uh, um, you know mechanical gears. Right. Uh, you also get that wider selection of props. <laughs> it's also very noisy. I mean, you you notice that. I mean, you know, <laughs> it does make a bit of noise. Yeah. I mean, some yeah. of that's from the prop, but most of that's from the motor. Right. And these are tiny little motors. So. Huh. Typically, we don't use in runners. We like to use out runners. Right. Direct drive's the way to go. And I, I guess because it doesn't make a lot of torque, it's better for the smaller props. Uh, or, well, because as you get bigger, you have to have more torque. We'll, we'll talk. We'll talk okay. about that. We'll talk ahead? about that. You're you're, you're getting on me. I know Sorry. You don't like that. <laughs> now, as a rule, the faster that a motor spins, the more efficient it's going to be. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that we've, we've learned about, uh, about motors, especially brushless motors, which right. is if you spin it faster, you're going to get more of the electrical energy turning into mechanical energy. The know. slower it spins, you, it's not as efficient, but you're going to get far more torque. Mm, okay. uh, think about it like uh, the electric motorcycle. The starting torque was ridiculous, right? Right, and then as it got to a higher RPM, it kind of peter out? It starts to peter out. You don't get as much torque, but you do get much more efficiency. So it's, it's one of these, it's like a reverse curve for a gas hmm. motor where you start with a lot of torque and then you go to increased efficiencies, whereas a gas engine will start with very little torque and, then and build up move as to it. improved efficiencies until it starts going back down. Okay, very yeah. cool. Yeah. And that, now, also, uh, in-running in motors are very, very fast, uh, but they do provide little torque, so, uh, you know, this is just something that you should keep in mind. Essentially, we're only going to use in-runners on trainers. Okay, okay. okay. Right. Now, let's <laughs> go by the numbers, and uh, go ahead and run that second piece of uh, B-roll, Alex. When we start talking about motors, the first thing that you're going to get is what's called the KV. It's the, ki it's the voltage constant. That's the theoretical number of times that the motor turns for every volt that you supply it. So in reality, that number is actually going to be slightly less because the motor is not 100% efficient. But this is the Turner G1704. It's, it's a 1900 kV outrunner. That means that when we give it 11.1 volts, it's going to turn 21,090 times per minute. That's 1900 times 11.1. Uh, wow. And it increases for every volt that we give it. Again, you know, we like to have those high efficiencies. Now, uh, one of the nice things I like about this is because it's a smaller motor and because it does turn faster, this is kind of ideal for 250 classes. And when, it, when you have a motor that includes the bullet connectors like mm -hmm. this, Make it, it a lot easier. makes it a lot easier to install. Now, this one's the newer A22112. It's a 13, uh, it's a, a, a KV1000 brushless motor. That means that when we give it 11.1 volts, it will turn 11,000 times, 11,100 times per minute. Now, it's a bigger motor, so it's going to turn slower, which also means it's going to generate more torque, so I can turn bigger props. This one's an Emacs MT2213 935KV. Now, when we <laughs> give it 11.1 volts, it will turn 10,378.5 times per minute. Again, slower torque, still the same size engine as that newer, right. which, which, I mean, slower, uh, slower rotation speed, which means you're going to have more torque. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, what all that means is the larger the motor that you choose, the bigger the prop it's going to be able to carry. Okay. Uh, when I use something like these, uh, the, uh, the, the 1740s here, these are only going to be able to drive maybe four to six inch props. When I start moving up to something like the newer here, this yeah. newer is going to be able to drive anywhere from seven, eight, maybe ten inch props, and then the uh, the Emacs here, this Emacs is could actually drive twelve inch props if I if I really wanted to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So that's that's a nice little smattering of props. Here's here's the problem when you're trying to choose a motor. Hmm. 
Aside from the KV, so every motor will give you its KV rating. So how many times is, is it going to turn per minute when you give it a volt? Mm -hmm. They are not really <laughs> equal. detailed. They're not really you know, manufactured. Or... Like the numbers that they include, I was trying to find some sort of formula. Yeah. The numbers that they include before the KV, they really mean nothing. Okay. Uh, outside of that line. So within that manufacturer, that might mean like the bigger the number, the better, the bigger the number, the more power you get. <laughs> it's really nothing. You, you, one of the ones that you do want to find, if, if the motor includes thrust, like how, what's the max thrust? Like for example, the max thrust on this Emacs is 850 grams. Uh, and ideally what I want is I want at least a 1.5 to 1 thrust to weight ratio. So if I know that this thing weighs one kilogram, I need 1.5 kilograms of thrust just to get it into the air. It's going to perform horribly, hmm. but that's what I need. I, ideally, what you want is you want something closer to two, one to two or one to three ratio. This does a one to two ratio. This actually does a one to four ratio. Right, and you were telling me about uh, the test you did where you started from the ground and just see how high you could get it in a short amount of time and uh, you lost it in the sky for a little uh, bit? Yeah, <laughs> because I mean, I was so used to, to uh, playing with the, the, the trainer. Yeah. And the, the trainer, I mean, you really can't get into trouble. You have no. to try to get in trouble. Yeah. So I tuned this thing up and I had it, I had it doing some lazy hovering on our football field and I jammed the throttle. And uh, I was on a football field in the end zone and it was in the other end zone in about a second and a half. That's crazy. And it, it's just, yeah, I mean, it, it's, just like, it's just like racing. Mm -hmm. If you can put more power into a smaller frame that weighs less, you have a better power ratio and you can do more things. Yeah, that's just, yeah. yeah. Now we've got people in the chat room who are saying, well, okay, so why don't I just put the biggest motor I can into the smallest frame? I you could Good do that. question. We're actually going <laughs> to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but, but first, here's a few things to remember about, about choosing your motor. First, okay. you need to choose your shaft. All right. Um, uh, take a look at the motors that we've got here. So this is, this is that newer. This is the, uh, the DJI one. This is the one that actually come, came in the, the Burked uh, yeah, quadcopter. Yeah, you can see it's, the shaft is a lot bigger than right. that other one. This is the Emacs, which is about the same size as the... Uh, uh, is that a standard? Uh, it, uh, yeah, well, no, it's not a standard, but the, the, the mount is standard. Okay. Uh, and then we've got this, which is the 1704. If, if you notice, go ahead and go back to that, uh, that second bit of the uh, B-roll, um, Alex. If, if you notice, the shaft size differs and the shaft length differs. Hmm. That's going to that's gonna affect what kind of prop you choose for your quad. Right. Uh, so if you use the, that skinny one in the middle, the, the newer, you're going to need some sort of adapter to hold the, the, uh, the prop to it. This one actually has a long screw on it, which means I can put a, uh, a, a basically any prop, mm -hmm. uh, and I've got enough uh, leeway there to, to, to fasten it down. Uh, and again, let's, let's, let's we're going to see the newer one here. This newer one actually uses a uh, it's, it looks like a, a hub, a spinner hub from a from a, a, an airplane that allows me to fasten up to 12 inch props on it. Although I, I wouldn't want to run that off of the newer. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it, it's so, yeah, prop size is going to be, uh, shaft size is going to be the first thing you want to consider. Do I want to have to run an adapter or do I want to direct connect it? Hmm. The second thing is size it to your frame. Uh, this is a direct answer to the people who are like, wait a minute, why didn't I just take this big old honking motor and, and put, put it on the little Put it on this. Yeah. Uh, if you have a 250, an X250 size frame, so that's, that's this thing. Right. Then you're going to want a smaller, faster spinning motor. The reason for that is, uh, and we're going to address this when we talk about props, smaller props can be incredibly agile, but you need to spin them incredibly fast. Uh, and these smaller motors tend to have much higher RPM, just lower torque. Right. Um, also, if you put a big motor onto this, you're actually hurting the power to weight ratio because you're wearing the thing down. There's a, a point of diminishing return. Yeah, because I can only spin this prop so many times before I'm no longer really getting any effect. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, it's not just get the biggest prop, biggest motor, go. <laughs> you got to size it appropriately. Okay. Um, yeah, if, if you want, the, if you have a larger craft, you're wanna go, wanna, going to want to go with one of the larger cans that spins a little bit slower but provides more torque right. because you're going to have bigger props which will need more force to turn them. Makes sense. Okay. Now, the third thing is feedback. Feedback, feedback, feedback. I would believe feedback more than I would ever believe any number that the manufacturer gives me. Oh, so you're talking about like enthusiast forums? Go to the enthusiast forums and see what works for them. Because again, 
the man, the the specs on the manufacturer they lie all the time <laughs> and you know like on oh. on on paper yeah. this dual engine looks incredible right. it is a piece of crap oh. it's a horrible horrible piece of crap so from people who have already tested it they found out yeah to pe look look at the, the enthusiast forums find out what they're using and, and they're really good about their specs someone will say oh i used a uh, a 250 class frame and i'm using 2212s uh, rotating at 2000 uh, with a KV of 2000 and you know tr and if you like what they're doing if you like their build then you buy that motor and that prop combo okay that makes sense uh, the the last thing is to choose the bullet connectors and the wires for you people sometimes mess this up there are different size bullet connectors uh, like this one is uh, uh, I believe this is a, th a 2.5 there's also three millimeter bullet connectors. There's also bare wire. So this one has no bullet connectors on it at so all. So are you gonna have to solder that then? Yeah, so this one needs to be soldered. This can be solderless, but only if I get speed controllers that have the same bullet size. Right. Um, I, I've, uh, I've seen a couple of people do builds where they buy all the stuff and then they get home and it's different size bullet connectors. So now you have to cut them cut off. Cut them and, and then solder them anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna do your build, plan on making sure that everything's actually gonna come together. Especially if you're not handy with a soldering iron. Yeah. Make sure you get the bullet connectors and make sure you get the right size bullet connectors. These little motors are really well put together. They're incredibly. Like, actually, those are probably my favorite. Uh, <laughs> the, the, they those make the 250 just absolutely scream. These are cool. Yeah. Now, when we come back, uh, we're going to be picking up on props because now that you know how to choose your motor, we need to tell you how you're going to pair a prop to it. Remember, this, is, this episode is all about power. But before we did that, we wanted to go ahead and take some feedback. Ah, uh, yeah, from the Google Plus community. And uh, the first one was somebody asking to help me build a NAS. Actually, from Adam L. Idrissi? Mm. That's good. Uh, 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 sure. uh, sounds good. I like it. <laughs> yeah, is that close enough? Uh, so he was looking for to build a new low power server, and uh, he's currently using a D510 uh, mini ITX board with two gigs of RAM, two terabytes hard drive, a mini ITX case. The main purpose for this uh, for it was to have file sharing and backups, media streaming through Plex with a couple of desktop and laptops and XBMC. Uh, there's a monkey blocking the question. <laughs> Thank you, Padre. Um, and then there's new hardware he was looking for with the AMD Athlon 5350, uh, ASRock AM1H ITX motherboard with four gigs or eight gigs of RAM and four two terabyte WD red drives. We like those red drives. Uh, and he's still debating on a case. He's currently using Ubuntu. Uh, as a server and he loves it. My question is, should I install uh, an OS on an SSD or a USB drive or just install all four drives and install the OS one of the two terabyte drives? Would there be any advantage to of running an OS from an SSD or USB drive? Yeah, and I know where this is coming from. This is coming from uh, uh, the work that we did on the free NAS build, mm. where we ran the OS off of a thumb drive, off of a flash drive. Right. Which, right. which you know, actually works quite well. Um, what I would say, Adam, is this. I love where you're going. I love the fact that you're using the, the red drives. I love the fact that you're using decently spec hardware, because remember, the faster the processor, the more memory you give it, the more the operating system will be able to give back to you, especially if you're gonna run something like FreeNAS. Now this, hmm. this idea of where should I install the OS, this has always been a debate. <laughs> uh, if you're gonna be using FreeNAS, it's a no-brainer. You install it on a flash drive. Right. Why? Because it just loads and then it very rarely goes back to that drive. So you just need that read at the beginning of the boot. Uh, and installing it in either an SSD or a hard drive would just be a waste of space. Right, and you're also saying when you install it to USB, uh, USB, have it maybe like inside the case somewhere where it's right. not going to get like knocked off. Or right, something like right. That. Now, if you are actually looking at building a storage server, but you're going to be using an OS that maybe could do other things, and if you think you're going to make it do other things, then absolutely, positively, 100%. I would say use uh, an SSD drive. Hmm. You can get a small one just for the operating system partition, but the benefits of having an SSD in there is going to be fantastic, especially if it's not pairing the, uh, the operating system along with one of the drives that's supposed to contain your data. Hmm. Uh, now, there's going to be people out there who say overkill. They're going to say USB drive. 
And normally I would agree. If if he was going to install FreeNAS, which is such an, a small operating system right. and doesn't have a lot of two-way communication, I, I would just go ahead and put it on a, a USB drive. But, but in this case? In this case, because I don't know what operating system he's going to use, and it sounds like he wants to build a server that can do storage and then probably a lot of other stuff. Right, multitask. I, yeah, I'd yeah. say use an SSD. Uh, it, the problem is I, I believe that you're actually going to run out of SATA ports. I, I, I'm not sure, but it, if you have not yet bought your motherboard, what you can do is get one of the ones that has the M SATA connector on it. That's the little, it looks like a PCI slot, PCI Express slot on the motherboard. You can buy small SSDs up to about 64 gigabytes that install on the motherboard. The nice thing about that is it keeps it nice and neat, so you still only have your, your storage drives in the bays, and the operating system itself is contained on the motherboard. That's, that's probably the, the way I'd go. Yeah, sounds like uh, the right path to take. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we also have one more here from uh, Eddie Foy. I kind of <laughs> like this. This is, this is cool. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Eddie asked, help me sync. Uh, he said, hey guys, I'm looking for a syncing solution, Mac, Linux, or Windows. Here's what I want. Server and laptop. If the file exists on the laptop and server sync, if the file exists on the server, uh, skip. Don't, don't copy to laptop, but keep on server. And if the file only exists on laptop, sync. So yeah. it sounds like you found like a one-stop solution for this. I did. This is actually something that I reviewed probably, what, like eight years ago. It, it's been really? a really long time <laughs> since I first took a look at this. Uh, what he wants is he wants selective sync. I, and I know there's actually a lot of people who want this, where Dropbox is no good for you or OneDrive is no good for you because you don't want to just either sync it or not. You want some sort of logic behind the sync. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and let's you know, forget what he said for a second here, uh, but, but consider, let's say you have a file and you want it to sync to the cloud if it's contained only on one device, but if it's contained on two devices, then don't. You know, it's that kind of logic. Right. Luckily, there is a off-the-shelf piece of software that works really well for it. It's called GoodSync. And uh, Alex, <laughs> if you go ahead and go to that link, it's a, this is a piece of software that I've played with for a while. The nice thing about this is that it does let you set rules for when it does and does not sync. Now, whether or not you can get the, the, the resolution uh, of of, uh, of uh, logic tree that you want, it's kind of depend on exactly if you know what you want out of your logic tree. Hmm. Uh, but this this does you know do sync if you have this, don't sync if you have that. Sync between two devices if you have this, don't sync between two devices if you don't have it. I, I think that this is actually going to work for you. I, this does have a free trial. At least it did the last time I used it. Uh, so, so try it out. See if it works. It's not that expensive, and it's actually fantastic. GoodSync is one of these pieces of software that if I have to pay for something, this is probably the one I'm going to get because it works really well. It works with FTP. It works with all the major uh, you know, Dropbox, SkyDrive uh, right. utilities. And it's just, it's just a solid piece of software that's very easy to configure. Yeah, it's nice that it, it does work with all those different OSs and mobile, too. So, yeah. very cool. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, there you go, Eddie. Uh, just pick up a copy of GoodSync or download, try it out. Tell us if it works for you. If it doesn't, we'll, we'll give it another go. We'll see if I can find you out something else that might work. Uh, but uh, before you, you judge it, make sure you have the logic tree for what you want to and don't want to sync down, mm -hmm. because that makes it easier for you to program whatever solution we find. Cool. All right, so back to quadcopters and props. Props, okay. Now, I'm going to throw a bunch of numbers at you, man, <laughs> and I'm sorry about it. What do it. they mean? He's like, oh, it's, all, it's all double prop rainbow and stuff. Okay. Anytime we look at a prop, mm -hmm. there's always two numbers that should stand out. So when you're, when you're thumbing through Amazon or through Hobby King or uh, White Spy, uh, was it White, White Spy? White Spy. Well, yeah, the, the, the guy that we had on, the, on the, the Google Hangout the other week. Oh. There's two numbers that you want to take a look at, diameter mm -hmm. and pitch. Diameter is right. easy, so yeah. it's the, so, from tip to tip how long this is. So this is a 10-inch prop. Mm -hmm. uh, this one right here, this is an 8-inch prop. Okay, yeah. Okay. And then over here, you've got a bunch of 5-inch props. Right, that's uh, pretty tiny. Yeah, these are pretty tiny. Now, the size is just one thing. The other thing that you have is pitch. Which is the angle of the... The prop itself, right? And so, for example, this has a, a, a this is called a five by three. Mm -hmm. So it's a five inch by three, and the three is the pitch. And what the pitch means is that for every revolution of the prop, it's going to pull it forward 
by that amount. So if it's hmm. a five by three, it means every revolution of the Savage prop will pull the model forward three inches. Wow, okay. Yeah, it, it doesn't actually work out that way oh. because of but any it's number. But the closest. Yeah, uh, it's, an, it's a good approximation. Okay. Yeah, so like these are, that. this is an eight by four, I believe that's a 10 by 4.5, hmm. okay. uh, right? So, so you can get different diameters and different pitches. Yeah. You can have big props, you can have small props, and you can have what are called aggressive props mm -hmm. or less aggressive props. Depending on what you want to use it for. Exactly, and now we need to, we need to discuss what they are used for. Hmm. Uh, now, uh, the more angled they are, the higher the pitch, the higher the pitch, the more aggressive, the more aggressive, the more top speed you're gonna get. And what about maneuverability too? Oh uh, well, no? yes, and you also get maneuverability. But that angle, that aggressive pitch, also tends to affect the aerodynamic performance. Hmm. It's not as stable, uh, and also it's gonna it's gonna put a bigger drain on your battery. The higher the pitch, the harder the engine has to work to turn it, which means you're gonna be sucking in more current, which means you're gonna drain the flight systems more quickly. Hmm. Okay, now choosing your prop is all about balancing top speed, lift capacity and power drain. Those are the things that we just talked about. Right. So the larger my prop, so my 10 inch prop mm -hmm. can theoretically lift more than my eight inch prop on the same engine, right. which can lift more theoretically than my five inch prop at the same, on the same motor. Right. Right. So that's, that determines how much weight it can actually carry. The higher the angle, the higher the top speed of the, of the model. Okay. Okay, so in other words, if I have a very non-aggressive angle, let's say I have like a 10.2, mm -hmm. so a 10 inch, 10 inch prop by a two, two inch pitch, uh, it, it will carry a lot, yeah. it's not gonna draw much power, but my top speed is really limited, because as, as fast as I can spin it, I'm still only gonna get that, that two degree uh, pitch. Right, you're right? not gonna be generating a lot of thrust with it. Exactly, exactly, but it is more stable. Okay. Uh, now, uh, I can also go up and down in pitch and in size, and that will change the amount of power I draw. So either increasing the size of the propeller or increasing the pitch of the propeller, is, are there both of those are going to increase the demand on the motor. Right. Okay. And then in conjunction, drain your battery, yeah. And drain the battery, right. The more, the more power I demand from my motor, the more power it's gonna draw from the speed controller, the more power that's gonna draw from the battery. Okay. Okay, so that's, that's what I'm talking about, the balancing game. Hmm. Uh, that, uh, in the chat room, they're saying, well, why won't you just go with a really big motor and a really big prop with a super aggressive pitch? You could do that, and you'd have a flight time of like 60 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and that wouldn't be very fun. And that would not be very fun at all, right? Uh, so it, it is all about, this, actually, this is, this is not a problem. This is what I like about quads. I change up my props all the time depending on how I want to fly. If yeah. I want a lazy flight, yeah. I take a, a you know a medium-sized prop with with a non-aggressive pitch. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go really fast, but I get to I get to hover and, and move around. Yeah. If I'm if I'm really cranking yeah. on on this thing, you want to shoot across that football field. Shoot across the football field. I'll use a, a six-inch prop with a like a six by five. Um, and yeah, my, my battery will be drained, but it's just crazy how much speed and uh, acrobatic agility I can get out of it. So I know this question might mean that the props will be more expensive, but uh, are there variable adjusting props? There are, uh, not really for quads. For quads. It's, it's, just, it's too hard to do it for quads. Just and it's easy crazy to switch them out. expensive. <laughs> yeah. And now something else to remember, and this, mm -hmm. this actually, this puts this whole frame size, motor size into uh, perspective. The key to flying a quad mm. is thrust management. Because thrust is how you get altitude, it's how you lose altitude, it's how you maneuver. It's yeah. all about thrust. Remember, the quad, it has no wings. It doesn't right. glide. It, it, it rests on the thrust being generated by its props. Which means the more quickly you can change between different thrust states, the more quickly your, your model can move and, and maneuver. Right, right. right. So, and, uh, and that's why these smaller quads, these are the ones that they use for racing, these 250s. It's why they use these really small propellers, because really small propeller means very minimal weight. Mm -hmm. Very minimal weight means I can speed them up and slow them down almost instantly. Right. There's almost no, you know, it's very little mass. So I can, I can go from zero RPM to the, the 15,000 RPM in the blink of an eye and then back. Yeah. 
So well, very agile. Very agile, right. So I can, I can really fine tune the amount of thrust I can give. I can really rock the quad back and forth. But you wouldn't use this for racing. You wouldn't because now we're using one of these props and when you compare the weight of this to the weight of this, this is going to speed up and slow down so much more and slowly. Yeah, and there's more rotational mass. There's so. more rotational mass, which means it's not going to slow as quickly, which means it's not going to speed up as quickly, which means I'm never going to get the agility out of a 450 or even a 350 than I can out of a 250. Uh, See, that's, is, now it's in a click, right? Yeah, yeah. this right? is so cool that we have all the different models because it, like, each one is kind of a balancing act between yeah. how much power do you want, how much efficient, how efficient you want it, and then what do you want it to do. Yeah. So it's like, these are the ones we play with, and they're tiny and they're fast. The bigger one is the one that you would like strap a camera to because it's bigger and more stable. Exactly, exactly. Now, uh, there is one other factor here. You'll hear a lot about carbon fiber props. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and these are crazy expensive, but the reason why people like them is, like this is an eight inch prop. So this is the same size as this prop, but this weighs about half as much as this. Ooh, I do like carbon fiber. Yeah. It looks a lot cooler too. It <laughs> looks cooler, it's, it's a bit sturdier, but the big thing is the weight. If this weighs basically as much as this plastic five inch prop, that means I can speed this up and slow it down as quickly as I do to this. That's cool. So I do get a lot of maneuverability back with this, but of course the downside is these are expense. crazy expensive. And uh, from my experience, they, they chip really easily. They, well, <laughs> all of these props are gonna chip really easily. I, so I, if you break them? I have a box of broken props at yeah. home. And uh, that's, that's the other thing. Once you start getting into this, yeah. Buy a lot just of props. get props. Just, yeah, just that's what you're saying. You uh, you buy them in like eight packs. Yeah. yeah. And remember, this is something we covered early on. Uh, on any given quad, you have two different types of props. You've got the, the rotating, the the count, the clockwise rotating, and the counterclockwise rotating. Mm -hmm. So it's not like if you break a prop, you can just replace it with any of the prop in the box. You've got to <laughs> right. find the right you have size to get another and the right set. rotation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so let's 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 get the takeaways. We're, okay. we're starting to run out of time here. And so if somebody was looking at buying the props for their motors, uh, what the, again the temptation is going to be to get the nope. largest motor with the largest pop with the most aggressive pitch. Right. And you might think that gives you the most speed, the most capacity, and the, uh, the best performance. Not necessarily. But yeah, that means that you're going to be running your prop b below the gold band, the most efficient speed of your motor. You, you really don't want to do that. That also means that you're killing your flight time because mm -hmm. you're sucking power out of the battery. It also means that uh, you're not going to get the throttle management that you want. Uh, you may think that it goes really, really fast, but it also means that it's not going to turn so well. It means it's not going to increase or decrease altitude so well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's not about bigger is always better. Sometimes smaller is a lot faster. Uh, since the larger the, your, your prop is, the slower it is to spin and slow down, it means that if you want agility, you're going to want to go with a slower slash lighter prop. Okay. Uh, right? Uh, now, there is another temptation, and, and people are going to think of this. Well, if I don't want bigger is better, what about smaller? Like, get really, really small. <laughs> You could do that. Yeah. Uh, you could get like the 250 and say, okay, I'm going to get the highest RPM motor, the fastest spinning motor I can yeah. with like three inch props. And this thing will fly like a bumblebee. Yes, it yes. will. It will totally fly like a bumblebee. It will be crazy fast, crazy agile. The problem is you're going to miss out on top speed. You're going to miss out on cargo carrying capacity. And also... Generate really, really, really high RPMs generate a crap ton of heat. Right. I mean, if these are spinning at 21, what was it, 21,000 RPM? That's pretty quick. <laughs> it's pretty quick, and remember, heat is wasted energy. Right. Uh, so, in, I, I'm sorry we're gonna have to do this to you, but uh, we'll have all the takeaways in the show notes. What it, what it ultimately comes down to is how you wanna fly your quad. Mm -hmm. If you wanna learn, what I would suggest is you get something with larger motors, with larger props, with a less aggressive pitch because that will let you practice your hovering mm -hmm. uh, and your, your basic maneuvering. As you get better, you can start going with, with uh, smaller but faster spinning props, faster spinning motors, more aggressive pitches, which will give you that, that agility. Uh, and ultimately, it's gonna come down to your comfort level. If, if you have a set of props on and the model's not moving the way that you want it to move, mm -hmm. change your props. And now that you know how it is affected, right. you can either go increase in size, decrease in pitch, or increase in, mo in motor rotation. That's all gonna affect where your, uh, your, how your quad's gonna handle. Well, and the thing I love about these uh, trainer ones that we've been playing with too, there's a high and a low setting. 
So yeah. when we're inside, I practice with the low setting, but then when you're outside on the low setting, it, it feels kind of sluggish, it doesn't yeah. like uh, mm -hmm. move as fast. And then when you set it to high, it's like, oh. It just takes off. And then you yeah. get to play with it, yeah. And we're actually gonna talk about that because these more advanced models also do have what we call a dual stick rate. Oh, so uh, you can give, uh, adjust how much power everything exactly. gets. Exactly. So uh, so this, actually, I can flip this switch right here. Uh -huh. And when I flip the switch, it moves it from sane to insane. <laughs> and insane. Can I get one of those on my car? <laughs> <laughs> you do. It, you, it's the NOS nitrous. button. It's yeah. the NOS button. <laughs> no, but so when I go to insane, essentially mm -hmm. what I'm telling it is turn off the flight leveling. Uh, and for every movement of the stick, yeah. like multiply it. <laughs> uh, which which gets me ridiculous. I mean, it's twitchy, yeah. and it will it will slam into the ground without even thinking about it. But it also means it's ridiculously acrobatic. Uh, when I put this into insane mode, the yeah. the high rate, uh, I can do flips. I can I can make this thing turn around on on like one of its props, do this like little out of control spin thing. Oh yeah. But I mean, it's <laughs> dangerous. Be careful. Yeah, be careful. Does that use up any more battery or? It's yeah. You're gonna use it more. A little bit more of a drain. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, because if you're going to high stick uh, uh, high stick rate, then mm -hmm. it normally means that you're like really revving the engines like oh, up, up and down, up and down, up and down, down all yeah. the time. Yeah. Okay. So that is power. Power. So now, now, folks, you have the frame. <laughs> we told you how to choose your frame. We've also told you how to choose your motors and how to choose your props. Next time we have to get into the electronics, we're actually going to show you the smarts of your quad. Brain. That's this thing right in between uh, the, the, uh, the legs. This is the brain. So once I get my motors and my props mounted, they have to be controlled somehow. It's going to go through the electronic speed controllers to this. And we're going to show you exactly how to choose yours and uh, how to install it. Yeah, because then you can uh, you can add like GPS stuff to it, so it has like a come home yeah, function like that. and all that's all those goodies. This used to have that. Yeah, until we okay. ran it into the ground. Uh, the, the, actually, I'm pretty sure the GPS is busted. I, yeah, I, like, the, the board is cracked. The, the actual the the board right here. The actual top. no good no it, the GPS is in the top shell. Oh, it's actually got a hole oh. in it. I don't know. Yeah, this thing, we really put that thing through the ringer. Yeah, we should have had more of these little guys before we ever I ever tried to play with Oops. the DJI. Now before we go, we have a parting shot that has nothing to do with quadcopters. Nothing. And uh, Alex, if you could roll that. Uh, we started wondering, well, what happens when you put a bunch of oysters into a tank of really, really dirty water? There are a lot of oysters in this area. There There's are like a, a lot bunch of oysters. oyster farms out, out uh, near us. This is so awesome. We've got two tanks with identically murky water. We've got oysters in one of them. And, and look at this time lapse. So you can actually see how much time it's taking. And those things clean out all that, and it's really disgusting They're stuff. the filters of the ocean. They are the filters of the ocean, which, which then leads me to think... Why am I eating oysters? <laughs> right? Yeah, okay. I did I did think that too, but oh, I, it's harmless, right? What? Other than what if they started ingesting heavy metals or something like right, that, right? Right, exactly. They they will filter everything out of the water. So, do I really want to eat it after it's filtered everything out of the water? But they're so good when they're it makes them so tasty. Oh. Yeah. Actually, that's probably why pork tastes good too. <laughs> <laughs> the just, garbage animals. I just made the, the connection. Oh, oh, garbage animals God. taste the best. I, think I have a follow-up image for that, Alex. Uh, we went more into depth oh, with no. this. Oh no. There we go. See, uh, oh, there's a yeah. tank on the left with no oysters, and then a, a tank on the right with. Uh, and, and now we know it, oysters are delicious and dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> They're deadly. <laughs> <laughs> Very deadly. Who knew the harmless things? oyster was a <laughs> deadly, <laughs> deadly machine? Folks, that does it for this episode of Know How. Uh, remember, next week we're going to be taking you through how to integrate these things into the power system. And I believe uh, we may be showing off some Adobe Premiere stuff. Perhaps. I don't know. It, perhaps? Perhaps? Mm. I don't know. We're going to have to celebrate um, the win of a certain <laughs> local sports team. Oh, yeah. So yeah, we yeah. may not have anything for you next week. I'm surprised we haven't mentioned that yet <laughs> this whole episode. We've been pretty good about we've, it. We've been really good about yeah. it. Oh, but we know that this was a lot of information. I actually have detailed notes on motors and on props, how to choose them, how they relate to one another. They're going to go into our show notes. So make sure to go to buy our show notes page Where in order that? to get those. Uh, where, where did they find those, Brian? Ah, uh, twit.tv slash kh. And there's also all our past episodes and definitely the this last quadcopter series if you've missed an episode you want to go back and check those out um, and Padre has been doing 
I have to give you credit. You've been doing a great job uh, keeping track of all the parts and listing everything and their prices. So uh, definitely check that out. Subscribe to the show and make sure you get every episode uh, so you don't miss anything. Yeah, yeah. And, and remember, you can always use those show notes to go back because we did give you the parts list. Uh, mm -hmm. People have been asking, well, where did you buy X? What did you buy Y? Everything that we're going to be using in this project, we've already given you a link to yeah. get. It's in that first uh, episode. Of, uh, of quadcopter build. Mm -hmm. um, also, don't forget that you can also find us on our Google Plus page. Just go to gplus.to slash twitkh uh, and you'll find yourself as part of a community that's, it's, it's almost, yeah. I think it's like, we're getting close to eight. Yeah, we're getting, getting close, close to 8,000. 8, the nice thing about that community is that there's always people in there who are re who re ready and willing to help you right. no matter what stage of a build you're in. And there's great questions being asked all the yeah. time and yeah. helps you know, us uh, see what people are interested in. That's part of the reason why we're going to try and do more Google Hangouts in the future, too. Post your questions, and we'll try to get to them to a f uh, in a future episode. Also, don't forget that if you're not into the G Plus groove, you can follow us on Twitter. Right. You can find me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. And I'm at cranky underscore hippo. Yeah. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balliser. And I'm Brad Burnett. And now that you know how, go do it. Your bojo, you gotta have power.